It was the morning of Wednesday, November 5, 1975. To us, the seven men working in Apache Sitgreaves National Forest, it was an ordinary work day. There was nothing in that sunny fall morning to foreshadow the tremendous fear, shock, and confusion we would be feeling as darkness fell. We were working on the Turkey Springs tree thinning contract. Basically, thinning involves spacing and improving the thick strands of smaller trees to allow for their faster growth. That day, November 5, we were cutting a fuel reduction strip up the crest of a ridge running south through the contract. Fuel reduction is the process of cutting the thinning slash into lengths and piling it up to be burned in the wet season. The boss, Mike Rogers, was 28, the oldest of the seven men. He had been bidding these thinning contracts from the Forest Service for nine years. That had been long enough to learn the hard way all the tricky pitfalls of the business. He was getting to where he could fairly consistently gauge the price per acre that would be underbid the other contractors and still allow a profit margin. Turkey Springs was the best contract, profit-wise, Mike had ever been awarded. In fact, it paid the highest acre price he had ever received. When we were piling, some of the men run saws while the others pile. I was running a saw, as were Alan Dallas and John Goulet. Dwayne Smith, Kenneth Peterson, and Steve Pierce were piling behind the cutters as we worked our way up the strip. Dwayne Smith wasn't aware of it, but I had to be constantly careful to fell my tree so as to miss him. His inexperience, or maybe over-eagerness, was causing him to work too close to me, instead of allowing a little accumulation of slash to put some distance between us. But at least he was trying. I could not say the same for Steve. I could see Mike, far back down the strip, restacking some sloppy piles to bring them up to specification. Steve took advantage of the boss's absence to rest his can momentarily on a handy log. He was ordinarily a good worker, but was a little disgruntled today because Mike had blamed him for some bad piles Dwayne had made. I was trying to keep my distance from the other men, but we were coming together on a thick place to one side of the piling strip. The noise of my own saw is loud enough, even with earplugs, without revving all three of them in one spot. Just then I saw a shadow and jumped, barely in time to escape a falling tree. I looked to see who would cut it. Alan. His mocking grin let me know it was no accident. I didn't let on that he had needled me. I moved farther up the strip to work. Alan always cuts like a crazy man. He was faster slower than anyone out there, even me. His speed helped acre production, but it kept him from being up to working every day. His uncontrollable temper was probably what made him saw like that, taking his anger out on the trees. Alan had nearly come to blows with almost everyone on the crew, including me. He had a way of picking fights he never finished. Although our differences were forgotten as far as I was concerned, and we were friendly on the job, I suspected that Alan might have one or two lingering bad feelings toward me. The afternoon sun was starting to cool as it began angling steeper down in the west. In the mountains, sundown comes early. It gets dark very quickly when Old Soul slips behind the trees and out of sight behind the high ridges. The gathering chill was beginning to numb my nose. With summer ending, it was starting to get down to 5 or 10 degrees at night. I worked a little faster to ward off the chill, eagerly anticipating the reprieve of the day's conclusion. Not long to go before we could head for home. Sunset had been 15 minutes earlier, but we kept cutting into the waning light. I checked my watch again. It was six o'clock at last. Mike was still down the hill a little way, picking up and repiling. I yelled and took the liberty of giving the stop work signal. The sound of the saws died, the final echoes absorbed into the deepening dusk. We loaded the chainsaws and gas and oil cans into the back of the 65 International. After arranging the gas cans so they would not tip over and leak on the bumps, Mike slammed the tailgate tightly. The decrepit pickup groaned on its tired old suspension as everyone piled in. There was Dwayne by the left rear door, John and Steve in the middle, and Alan by the right rear door. In the front, I sat by the door riding shotgun. Ken sat in the middle, and of course Mike was driving. The seven of us usually sat in the same place every day. Non-smokers in the front, smokers in the back. Mike started the old pickup and we climbed north up the ridge toward the rim road. It was 6.10. Barring any breakdowns, we should be home before 7.30. We left the windows down so we can cool off some. 
We were still warm from laboring in spite of the evening air. Mike, Ken, and I do not smoke, and we prefer to inhale genuine, unadulterated air. The four in the back seat lit up as soon as we were in the truck, eager after hours without a cigarette. The fresh air coming in my window was bracing. We usually nap on the way to work every morning, but none of us ever feels drowsy on the way back to town. The rousing activity on the job hones a keenness that stays with us all the way home. Bouncing over the water bars in the road, humps of dirt that prevent the road from washing out in the rainy season, the truck kept bottoming out on the springs with a dull clunking sound. The fellow started cracking jokes about the pickup. Just then, my eye was caught by a light coming through the trees on the right, a hundred yards ahead. I idly assumed that the glow was the sun going down in the west. Then it occurred to me that the sun had set half an hour ago. Curious. I thought it might be the light of some hunter's camp there. Headlights or maybe a fire. Some of the guys must have caught sight of it too, because the men on the right side of the truck had fallen silent. As we continued driving up the road towards the brightness, we passed inside of it for an instant. We barely got a glimpse through gnarled branches before we rolled past the opening in the trees. Son of a... Alan started. What the hell was that, I asked. My eyes strained to make sense of the glimmering through the dense strand of trees blocking our vision. From the open window I could see the yellowish brilliance washing across our path onto the road another forty yards ahead. Intrigued, I was impatient to get past the intervening pines. From the driver's seat, Mike could not look up with the proper angle without leaning way over. What do you guys see? he demanded curiously. Dwayne answered, I don't know, but it looked like a crashed plane hanging in a tree. Finally, our growing excitement spurred Mike into ringing out what little speed the pickup could still achieve on the incline. We rolled past the intervening evergreen thicket to where we could have an unobstructed view of the source of the strange radiance. Suddenly, we were electrified by the most awesome, incredible sight we had seen in our entire lives. Stop! John cried out. Stop the truck! As the truck skidded to a dusty halt in the rocky road, I threw open the door for a clear view of the dazzling light. My god, Alan said. It's a flying saucer. Mike shut off the engine. We watched, spellbound. The men on the left side of the truck leaned over so that they could see. There, a mere twenty feet above the ground, a strange golden disc hovered silently. Our attention was riveted on that object poised in the air. Impaled by the sight, we were held transfixed for one long, silent moment that felt like an eternity. The cold, jarring reality of what we were witnessing struck fear and awe to the core of every one of us. Suddenly beholding its vivid, magnificent structure summoned all emotions at once. You could almost hear our hearts pounding above the suspended instant of silence. Less than thirty yards away, the metallic craft hung motionless, fifteen feet above a tangled pile of logging slash. The craft was stationary, hovering well below the treetops near the crest of the ridge. The hard, mechanical precision of the luminous vehicle was in sharp contrast to the primitive ruggedness of the dark surroundings. Its edges were clearly defined. The golden machine was starkly outlined against the deepening blue of the clear evening sky. The soft yellow haze from the craft dimly illuminated the immediate area with an eerie glow. Under the weird light, the encircling forest took on bizarre hues that were very different from its natural colors. The trees, the brush, and the grass all reflected subtle, peculiar new shades. I estimated the object to have an overall diameter of 15 or 20 feet. It was 8 or 10 feet thick. The flattened disc had a shape like that of two gigantic pie pans placed lip to lip with a small round bowl turned upside down on the top. Barely visible at our angle of sight, the white dome peeked over the upper outline of the ship. We could see darker stripes of a dull silver sheen that divided the glowing areas into panel-like sections. The dim yellowish light given off by the surface had the luster of hot metal, fresh from a blast furnace. There were no visible antenna or protrusions of any kind. Nothing that resembled a hatch, ports, or window-like structures could be seen. There was no motion and no sound from the craft. It almost appeared to be dead in the air. I glanced from one to another stricken face turning back to that impelling spectacle in the air. I was suddenly seized with the urgency to see the craft at close range. I was afraid it would fly away and I would miss the chance of a lifetime to satisfy my curiosity about it. I hurriedly got out of the truck and started toward the hovering ship. The men were alarmed by my sudden action. What do you think you're doing? Mike demanded in a loud, harsh whisper. 
Placing my feet quietly, I quickly stalked closer to the mysterious vehicle, stepping over a low-leaning fir sapling. I carefully picked my way through the opening in the trees. I put my hands in my pockets in response to the cooler twilight air outside the truck. Hey, Travis, the men warned insistently. I stopped walking for a long, hesitant moment. I paused and turned to look back at the six men staring questioningly at me from the truck. The sober realization of what I was doing abruptly heightened the doubt I was already wrestling with. What should I do? I asked myself. Maybe I'm being foolhardy, I told myself. I won't get too close. But what if there's somebody inside that thing? I faltered. Finally, I reassured myself with, I can always run away. I was committed. Without replying to the guys, I resolutely turned and continued my brazen approach. I moved more slowly, cautiously, covering the remaining distance in a half crouch. I straightened up as I entered the dim circular halo of light softly reflecting onto the ground under the craft. I was about six feet from being directly underneath the machine. Bathed in the yellow aura, I stared up at the unbelievably smooth, unblemished surface of the curving hole. I was filled with a tremendous sense of awe and curiosity as I pondered the incomprehensible mysteries possible within it. I had become aware of a barely audible sound coming from the ship. I could detect a strange blend of low and high-pitched mechanical sounds. There were intermittent, high, piercing, beeping points overlaid on the distant, low, rumbling sound of heavy machinery. The strange tones were so mixed that it was impossible to compare them to any sound I could ever remember hearing. Travis! Get away from there! Mike yelled to me. I shot a fleeting look at the pickup parked in the road and then turned my attention back to studying the incredible ship. Suddenly, I was startled by a powerful, thunderous swell in the volume of the vibrations from the craft. I jumped at the sound, like that of a multitude of turbine generators starting up. I saw the saucer start wobbling on its axis, with a quickening motion, in a pattern like the erratic spin of an unstabilized top. The same side continued to face me, as the craft remained hovering at approximately the same height while it wobbled. I ducked into a crouch when a tremendously bright blue-green ray shot from the bottom of the craft. I saw and heard nothing. All I felt was the numbing force of a blow that felt like a high-voltage electrocution. The intense bolt made a sharp cracking or popping sound. The stunning concussion of the foot-wide beam struck me full in the head and chest. My mind sank quickly into unfeeling blackness. I didn't even see what hit me. But from the instance I felt that paralyzing blow, I did not see, hear, or feel anything more.